as an expert on book reviews, I'm telling you, you will love this review. Also, because all of your friends like it. And also, because it's only here for a limited time. Welcome, my Memortalized, to another round of the book reviews. My name's Karen, and I do these book reviews for those who want to transcend beyond their own mere mortality to dive deeper into the books that they are learning about to get a little bit of a review, a sneak peek, and maybe even some persuasion of why they do what they do and why you are influenced in the world. And indeed, we have the book Influence by Robert B. Cialdini. Now, this book was published in 1984, and it's about 300 pages in length. And it's, I suppose, an uncovering of the shortcuts that we use to make decisions in our day-to-day lives. So why do you make the decision you do? And also, you don't really think about every single decision you make. So what are some of the ways where your automatic systems just go, oh, this will help me choose which color um, pencil I'll use for the drawing or which brand of cereal I should buy or why I should trust this person or et cetera, et cetera. And then it also talks about how these can be hijacked and how the, I suppose, marketing world works. So the tagline of this book is influence the psychology of persuasion. And one of the quotes right on the front is for marketers, it is among the most important books written in the last 10 years. So this is definitely a book where if you want to understand how marketing works, this is a a book for you. Now, Mr. Cialdini lists six what he calls weapons of influence, uh, which he's derived from studies, from training, from observations, and a lot of firsthand experience as well. So how this is translated in the book, there are many stories from uh, his own life, from history, from when he was out going and, and on like the car lots and being a salesman and things like that. And, and also reader reports and even some sections of saying like how you might be able to uh, disassociate yourself or realize when someone's trying to influence you or persuade you to do something, which maybe you don't want to do. Now, I'll touch on the author himself and how this book is set out. Uh, and this is interesting in the fact that um, he was not just a researcher, so he's a a psychologist and more in the sense of the academic psychologist, so not particularly treating patients, but um, writing studies and and living in the world of academia. But for this book, he he mentions in the the pre-word or in the preface that he needed to actually go out and and get these this data for himself to feel it firsthand to really see it in front of his face because it's fine studying it and whatnot but it's not until you you're out in the real world where you see oh this is how it actually happens and so this is how he derived his six um weapons of influence although uh, i have learned later that in later editions so i believe from 2016 onwards he added a seventh principle i guess which he um uh, included and so like i said this book was published in 1984 it's gone through many editions and it's a it's a wildly popular book i'm going to touch on i guess it's not particularly a theme it's more just what i i took out from this book which is persuasion the seven weapons of influence so the book itself is set out into uh seven chapters although the first chapter in this one which doesn't have the the seventh um, rule that he added in uh which just goes over each one of them and the first one first chapter sort of explaining what a weapon of influence is and how he came about it so what are they Karen? let's get on to the actual weapons and what they are so the first one is reciprocation so if uh you're thinking, and I'll, I'll list these with a couple of examples from, from the book or also from, from real life, and then maybe touch upon why this is important or why uh, this can be used badly or just something ex- extra. So he talks about a study where uh, you the, the uh, researcher comes into the room and there's two versions of this. One comes into the room and he's like, hey, I just talked to my boss. I was going to get a Coke for myself, and he said it was okay. Uh, and so I bought one for you as well. So uh, he did a nice thing for the participant in the study. And then he asked them to do something for him later on, which was buy some raffle tickets or something like that. And because uh, a nice thing was done for the, the person being observed, they sort of felt like they needed to reciprocate by buying him a chocolate, uh, the buying some raffle tickets from him. And the, I suppose, interesting thing was they researched afterwards, okay, what 
was your liking level did you actually like this researcher the the guy who bought the coke or or didn't buy the coke and they found that they would reciprocate they would buy tickets from him even if they didn't like him so it was sort of like there's this principle of um if something is foisted upon you you almost need to reciprocate back even if you not even thinking about it um, another good example of this is the Hare Krishnas where they will in airports give you a gift of a flower or a petal or something and then ask you to donate money now this is interesting because I guess it enforces uninvited debts so if you are uh, being a little bit stinky about it you could give someone something of low value and then immediately or not maybe immediately but soon afterwards ask for something of higher value in return and through this principle of reciprocation, you're somewhat obliged to it, even if you're unthinking about it. So this can trigger unfair exchanges. The second principle that we have, um, and these are just the order that he listed in them. I don't believe he listed them in order of actual magnitude of, of how much they influence people, was commitment and consistency. So in this one, you could think of maybe American um, POWs in uh, prisoners of war in Vietnam. And they would be asked to do small things. So like write, um, maybe write something you don't like about America. Maybe write something um, of how it could be fixed. And then they would broadcast these messages to the whole camp. And then these people were now sort of in the pro-communist um, mindset because, oh, yeah, I, I did admit that there was something wrong with America. I did admit that we had our own problems. And so it was sort of showing like if you're... Uh, committed to something and also cons you're very consistent to it you need to to continue that onwards so even if you take a small little step in one direction if this is broadcast out to the world and and shown to people um so if you've ever done one of those surveys of where it's you can win a prize or something and all you have to do is write in 25 words or less or something you like about the company or whatnot even though there, you, you might get a reward from that, you are committing in your own head why you like this company and writing it down on paper so that in future, you're, you're already internalized like, hey, I'm a person who likes this company. I'm a person who does this thing. So it's sort of like consistency blocks thought in a way. So if you're consistent about something, you don't need to think about it. I, I like, oh, I consistently buy this product. And so I am now a Colgate fan, like a, a fan of this particular toothpaste. And then also if you're committed to it, you're, you're sort of committed to your identity and it's really hard to change that. So, oh, I'm a, a Colgate customer and that's really hard to change in your mind to now becoming another dental product fan or, or, um, or whatever. So that's commitment and consistency. We also have social proof. So in this case, think of canned laughter, which you can find on lots of sitcoms. Um, the, the observation where if you and a, a friend are in a crowd of people and you both look up at the sky, you'll notice that other people will also stop walking and look up the sky and you can get a mass formation of everyone looking up the sky at the sky even though nothing's there now this is kind of funny because um it's it's sort of assuming that other people know something it's like they have information they have vital information that could be very useful for me and so if everyone's doing it that's probably a good thing to do like maybe that's the safe thing to do um this can also of course be used in a negative sense where if you look at something like suicides if suicides are more broadcast out then the increase of suicides rises because it's like this is a weird one but it's like oh the social proof you know this celebrity has maybe committed suicide maybe that's a, a good thing to do if you're sort of on the fence of whether you want to live or not it's like well they did it so um maybe i should do it as well another one is liking so there's been plenty of studies looking at uh, attractiveness uh, as well as uh, similarity so if you're very similar to the person i.e all of us bald-headed people if we all if i see another bald-headed person i'm probably going to like him a little bit more or her a little bit more uh, if they're an attractive person, you're more likely to like them. And it's something about familiarity as well. So if you had a, uh, a picture of your face and showed it to a friend 
and then also a picture of your face but reversed and both of you judged which one you you liked better you would probably pick the reversed one because that's what you see all the time in the mirror you never actually see your face from the sort of correct point of view or from another person's point of view because you are always getting it in this mirrored version so it's it's I suppose something about yeah it's this one's not too too deep a principle it's just if you're if you like something you're more likely to be influenced by them uh if you like a a celebrity if you if you like your partner if you like your friend and they recommend a product to you you're more likely to be influenced or persuaded by that uh authority so this one is relatively simple as well so if someone is an expert like i mentioned right at the start an expert book reviewer you might be more likely to be persuaded that hey this is a good book review i'm listening to now so titles so you know you could be a phd you could be the coach you could be the you know insert whatever privileged position that person is in um, clothes are another way so you can show your authority through clothes so if you're a doctor wearing a, um, a one of the white whatever doctor um, robes that they have on if you're a policeman with the vest and things like that if you're a businessman um, you you can um, have some authority because it's like oh wow this person's you know must be high up in a company or something and you can see how this influences people by jaywalking, for example. So if a man in a, a suit jaywalks, you'll find a lot more people are likely to follow him jaywalking than if it's someone of, a, I suppose, like lesser value. Um, dentist selling toothpaste is another good. I keep going back to the, <laughs> the, uh, the toothpaste. But, uh, you know, if an expert is, is shilling this toothpaste, man, they, they must... Um, you know they must have that information they're they're very skilled they're very knowledgeable that i could be persuaded by that and it can be quite funny in different ways where even an actor who everyone knows is an actor but they played a role of a doctor in a very famous uh, rom-com or in a tv series and then they are uh, talking about this coffee which is uh, super health apparently super healthy even though you kind of know in your brain it's just an actor and they have no more knowledge about health health of coffee beans than your average person because they had that authority as a doctor on tv you, it sort of gets like a weird slight perception change so a couple examples there of how authority can um be used to influence and persuade people scarcity so these are things like stamps or baseball cards maybe even bitcoin if you're that that was an example in the book that's one i'm chucking in and this is sort of like i guess you'd think about it in terms of fomo so fear of missing out and valuing limited information um, and this gets extended out though so uh, you know if there's only a small portion of something um man i I, I got to get in now, like I need to, to get in. So it's sort of like a time preference as well. It shortens your time preference and it's like that thing that I could have waited for, oh, if, it, if I know it's scarce, I should probably get it now. So, I, you know, it could be gone um, by the time I need it. And the last one, and this is one that I had to just research online because it wasn't in the book uh, because the edition I have isn't um, up to date with the the latest one was unity. And this is the unity principle. So, um, it sounded like it was something like the need to belong. There's a psychological, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right around the middle, it's the need to feel like you're a part of a group, that you are that you have friends, that you belong. And so this is sort of in-group versus out-group thinking. Um, I don't have any particular examples of this other than maybe if you're a sports fan and your your team, your sports team seems to enjoy this type of beer, then maybe that's what you will be persuaded to drink as well because, hey, that's what you know my favorite team does and that's what everyone else is doing, so I should probably go along with it as well. So those are the, uh, the main points, I guess, that, that come out from this book, the main themes. I'll go on to my own observations and takeaways. One thing I do want to highlight right at the start was a lot of these sort of blend and merge in together. So a couple of the examples that I gave, you could also be like, mm, that same sort of principle also seems to be like an authority thing. So the prisoners of war, if they're being told by an authority, i.e. the person who's their jailer saying, 
no, 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 you're, you're, you're pretty pro-communist. Like, you know, you're, you're, um, you're showing a lot more signs of it than these other people and they don't know, blah, blah, blah. That could also be similar to the, you know, social proof one, or it could be the commitment and consistency, which is what it was being highlighted as. So they do tend to like blend and merge in a little bit together, but they are distinct enough that you can look at certain areas and be like, okay, I can see how that particular principle works for a used car salesman, for example. It's very similar, this book in many ways to Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which is, it presents a lot of studies and it's more the overall theme that matters, not one particular individual study. And I bring this up because they used in the authority section, the Stanley Milgram shock experiments, which are pretty debunked, like they're they're not good science. Uh, Nevertheless, they were used in this book, but I would still say that the authority section of, of this isn't wiped out just because one of the studies that he's included in here are a little, is, is, is kind of dodgy science. Um, there's no evolutionary reasoning in here as well. So if you're asking, if you want to, to find out, okay, but why do we do that? Why is social proof um, important? Why is why do we like attractive people? Why you know, do I want to reciprocate when someone does something? Well, those usually have an evolutionary basis underneath them, uh, but that's not what this book delves into. This delves into more like the surface level of this is what happens. Um, If you want to know that, you know, maybe go elsewhere and try and find that out. But this is what happens and this is how you can either change it or distort it or think about it in your own day-to-day life. And here's some practical examples. And speaking of practicality, it is practical in in very many ways. I really enjoyed the reader reports, which were uh, addition an addition to later editions, <laughs> where readers would come comment in, send him an email or a message or something like that, saying, "Oh, I I heard about the principle in the in in your book, and then this is how I applied it into my day to day life." Or, "Oh, this is how I understood now that." Um, I can use this or it made sense of this phenomenon that I kept repeating and seeing and repeating in real life, but it just didn't make sense. So this would be things like car crashes on the motorway where a policeman was saying like cars would move over and it would end up causing a car crash, even though there was no obstacle in front. And it was because people were sort of following what other people were doing, i.e. this is more the, I suppose, the social proof type type deal which is they might know something that i don't know um so yeah very very interesting and and also he included sections on how to say no so it was like this is where uh you know if someone is trying to pull these tricks on you if like a car salesman tries to um, use the reciprocation by giving you a like some candy right at the start and this helps him sell you like a fifty thousand dollar car you know, maybe there's a couple of steps you can say to be like, oh, no, I'm good, thanks. Like, I don't want that gift that you're forcing upon me um, because I don't want to be influenced by it. And then the final observation that I just wanted to make was, uh, this was more of a skim read for me. So I I had read this book uh, quite a while ago. I think it was around in 2013. So, geez, almost a decade ago. And um, I, I quite enjoyed it then. And I actually had taken some very extensive notes at the time. And I'm talking about pages and pages of, of information that I'd gained from this book and some particular ways where I could apply these techniques of persuasion in my own life. And I really enjoyed the book. So picking this up now, I sort of had read all of this before. I, I knew most of it. And it was more just of a skim read to reacquaint myself with some of these principles so in summary it's a i think it's a fantastic explanation of modern behavior so it really shows why we do why like maybe not the the deep underlying why but it shows what we do i suppose and explains that Uh, so it showcases why certain tactics of persuasion work with uh, real examples and it's extremely useful if one is willing to introspect on maybe how you're doing this unthinkingly in your day-to-day life and then also how other people are maybe consciously or unconsciously using these tactics on you as well. And so if you're finding yourself being persuaded into things that on retrospect you didn't want to do, it might be worth examining how that came about. 
and using that to your advantage or uh, or to other people's disadvantage if you're a little bit more on the um, Machiavellian type of scale. So I still think this is very relevant today, even though it was published um, in 1984. So what's that, 16 plus 20, 30 something years ago, almost 40 years ago. Uh, I still think it, it can be very useful for you if you're um, finding yourself being persuaded by things that you were being, you know, being controlled like a, a puppet by forces, which you, you d- didn't particularly want to be. So overall, I'm giving the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, um, eight and a half out of 10. It's a pretty damn good book. Uh, I, I, th- I found I got a lot of use from it personally for myself. And so that is it for today, my Mere Mortal Lights. Thank you for joining me to this part of the video. What are your thoughts? Were you influenced by my statements right at the start? Are you now um, uh, subjected to the having to give me a like, a comment, a subscription? Because I would love all of those things. Uh, And I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Kyron, out.